Get those, you know, get those muscles pumping, the blood flowing. Welcome to Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. Come set your cool and rain. Um, 
um, to the church so that we will be compliant with Sonoma County's um, health care rules. Um, also, today we're having a potluck and we're trying to be as appropriately socially distancing, so we're not setting up tables. We're just going to put some chairs out and we're going to serve the food. So if you feel uncomfortable with that, you know, we're trying to be as compliant as we can with that today. So please, please join us if you feel um, able to do that. We have a QR code QR code for online giving. It's posted also on the bulletin board in the back there, as well as in your in your uh, bulletin. So feel free to use that if you want to do the online giving. Today is a beautiful day. With all the changes going on, it's still a beautiful Sabbath day. Why do we come to church? I want you to think of two reasons why you come to church. What are your top two reasons? I love to look at lists, and so I was kind of looking up a list of why people come to church. And I was going to read some ten top reasons why we come to church. Number one, church connects us with God. That is, amen, that is an amen a reason why we come to church. We want to become connected to God every week, every day, every day. Uh, church gives us a chance to reflect on gratitude. Church connects us socially as a group. Church helps us build, better connect with our spouse. Actually makes us have better relationships with our, our family members when we come to church. It allows us to feel reverence. Um, we provide, it provides opportunities for giving back to our church, to the community, to others. Um, church helps us find the lesson in our trials. Church teaches us forgiveness. Church fills our hearts with song. I shouldn't say church, I should say God. God is where we find deeper meaning in our lives. Think about those reasons why we're here today to connect with God, to sing praises, to also be fulfilled. So welcome to the Santa Rosa Church. I hope you have a beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you. <laughs> want to let you worship with us however you are comfortable. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, if you want to roll around and lift up your hand, do what the Lord, how the Lord leads, please.
teach you a new song this morning. It's called King of Kings. So I want to teach you the chorus as you sing with us and just give you an opportunity to get a sense of that song.
thank you for each day you give us. We thank you for creating our world and coming to save us. And each day we wake up, help us be aware of those around us that we can reach out to them in some way and share your love. People in our neighborhood, people who walk by, people we meet, and perhaps even in the grocery store. Help us always to reach out to those who come near us. Thank you for everything you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Our scripture today is Matthew 9, 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, <clears throat> how many kids do we have here today? I see a lot of them. Today, um, I'll just let you stay in your seats. I've got a story for you. And um, I wanted to first read something, okay? I'm going to read from Genesis 1 starting with verse 20, okay? Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every little living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God said, it is good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. When I was, um, I don't know, about four years old, my grandpa used to have a cabin in the mountains, and he would take me fishing all the time. And that's why I still love it to this day. I remember looking at streams and just kind of passing them by and thinking, I wonder if there's any fish in there. And um, it just caused me to, to think of creation. God said be fruitful and multiply. And as you can see, these are brook trout in their spawning colors and they're laying their eggs to be to multiply into others and i can't help but think that perhaps just perhaps that maybe god maybe looked into one of these streams maybe saw his reflection and said you know tomorrow tomorrow I am going to create my masterpiece. And so what did God create on the sixth day? He created man, you and I. And I'm just wondering, God may have just possibly said, you know, as he looked at his face in the waters, just, I think I want I want all the kids in Santa Rosa to look like me. And I want to get down on my knees and take some of the water from the brook and make some mud 
and I want to make a sculpture. You know God's an artist, right? I want to sculpture a man, and I want him to look like me. In fact, I'm even going to give him the breath out of my own mouth. And that's what happened. God created man, woman, kids, to make him look like him. And what that tells me is that a lot of the other things he spoke into existence, like the fish, and they're so beautiful, but you are God's masterpiece. And I think it's so important And it's okay, I think it's important to have the courage to say, you know what, <clears throat> I was no accident. I was created in the image of God. Thank you. Well, happy Sabbath. One of my favorite things, am I? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. One of my favorite things about being part of the Seventh day Adventist church family is that we are more than just a local church family. And here, especially in Sonoma County, we are an extended family of schools and churches. And we have, I think, an amazing opportunity to just spend more time praying for, investing in, and blessing one another. We've been blessed this morning by uh, Rika Meyer, who led us in music. What a, a blessing that was. Thank you so much, Rika. Rika is the VP for all the things that matter at Rio Lindo. And uh, Meki Lapulu is here as well. He's the new principal of Rio Lindo Academy. And we're going to just spend a few minutes focusing on all the amazing things that God is doing up at Real Endo. We're going to start with a little video. Good morning, Church. Thank you for letting us come and worship with you this morning. Again, my name is, oh, I guess I can take this off from here. Um, my name is Rika, and I've been at Rio Lindo just up the road from Santa Rosa for 12 years, 12 years, I can't believe it. And a couple of our staff are also 
Allison here. I see Karen up here who's doing the live stream. Miss Sylvia who makes the best, best potato tacos. We have like a theme song for her potato tacos when she goes into the cafeteria. But we wanted to say hello. I know that we're going to be also visiting Redwood um, staff in a couple of weeks in church. But we're so excited because we have a new principal this school year and his name is Mr. Lapulu. And I wanted to introduce him to you all and um, get to know him a little bit and talk about what Rio is looking like this year. So, Mr. Lapulu, Meki Lapulu, um, where are you coming from? And tell us a little bit about your background and what led you into Adventist education. All right, thanks, uh, Rika. I want to thank the Santa Rosa Seventh day Adventist Church and Pastor Brad for having us uh, here this morning. Uh, yes, my name is Meki Lapulu, and um, I'm coming from Antioch. Uh, I was a principal there. Uh, at a little school called Hilltop. And uh, when I arrived there six years ago, we had just over 60 students. And when I left, uh, we had 130 students. And so God is good. Uh, and before that, I was in our Central Conference and I, I was a teacher there for 14 years. Uh, it's funny how things work. Uh, when you're in Adventist school, you start off doing uh, kind of whatever. And I found out about the school with the bulletin. Uh, 20 years ago, I was sitting uh, in the church pew, and I was looking, I was uh, looking for something to do in the summer, and uh, it said they were looking for volunteers uh, at this local school. And so I went and volunteered, and I started off. At, I think I was teaching PE, and I kind of did everything there, and I ended up uh, being the vice principal before I left. Uh, and so God is good. So I hope you're reading your bulletins uh, each week because there's a lot of good information in in those bulletins. Um, I have three children. My wife and I have three children. Two of the oldest will be at Rio, and my youngest will be at Redwood. Uh, and so that's a little bit about me. Yeah, he, he came just about a month ago, and you know, boarding school life is very exciting. So we're we're very extraordinarily lucky to have him. Now this year has been an extraordinary challenge for young people, especially our teenagers. What can we expect from our students in starting school in the fall, and what can we do as a church community, as parents, as mentors, as youth leaders, what can we do to be mindful of what our teens are going through right now? That's a great question. You know, uh, last year was, was difficult, uh, not just for our students, uh, but for teachers and, and families. And so this year we're, we're so thankful that we were able to return in person so we are just praising God for that, that we're able to have those connections and see our students face to face, uh, not over a computer screen. And so um, our students are going to be coming back. A lot of them are going to be coming back, and it's going to be a shock because uh, they're going to be seeing each other, their friends, uh, many of them for the first time in over a year, seeing their teachers. And so um, it's going to be a shock to many of our students. And so we want to make sure that we are. Um, are there for them. I think the biggest thing as, uh, as families, church families, is we can just listen to our students, be there for them, um, and just give them some advice about making connections with, with uh, their friends. And it's just going to be a, um, a little adjustment to getting back to their normal schedules, waking up and, and getting a breakfast and making sure they're getting to their first class on time. Um, and so a lot of our students are, as well are going to be coming back with some, some learning loss. Because teaching and learning online is not the same as teaching and learning in person. Uh, and so our teachers are ready for that, and we're going to be ready for students that come in and um, making sure that we meet their needs academically. And so we're looking forward to getting that started in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, it sounds like intentionality is the theme, being intentional about reaching our youth. Thank you, church, for doing that for our kids. Now, what sorts of opportunities do Rio students have that they might not be able to get through Montgomery High or local public high school or through a homeschool program? Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that excites me about Rio is uh, we have uh, college and career uh, readiness for our students and we're preparing them. Uh, we have, I think we're one of the only schools uh, that has an industrial arts program for our students, you know, if they're interested and have a passion for it, uh, can do auto mechanics, you know, woodworking, you know, glass. And so there's not only the academics part of it, but also the spiritual part. You know, the other day I was walking, I think, in a, one of our student learning labs, and I saw a sign on the wall. And the sign said, students, 
We are more concerned about your spiritual well-being than your academic well-being. And I said, wow, that's awesome. And that's um, something that I want our students to know when they're at Rio. Yes, we care about your academics. Yes, we want to prepare you for that next step. But we're more concerned about your spiritual well-being and about you having a relationship with your father. And so that's uh, something that excites me about Rio. Now, do we have any students coming this year from Santa Rosa, Windsor, Cloverdale, all we, the way up and down? We do, we do, and uh, we, we need more from our Santa Rosa church and, and from our local community. And, um, you know, I, I never want uh, finances to get in the way of you sending your child to, to Rio. And so if you've thought about sending your child to Rio, maybe you know someone uh, in grades 9 to 12 of maybe a family member, friend, co-worker, or that has a child, we love to have them on Rio, and um, if there's a financial need, I would love to work with you, and to make sure that Christian education is not some fantasy, but we can make it a reality, uh, and so we'd love to have more of our, of our families here from San Jose attending Rio. And we've been so blessed to have Carmen join our team this summer, but then they're real, I'm pointing her out again, and she does work with families through financial aid process, and she's super friendly, bilingual, she's amazing, and she's been so cheerful to have around. Um, thank you all so much for having us here, and if you are interested, I'll stay after church if you want to talk to me, or Carmen, she's here, or Ms. Wolkulu, we'd love to meet you and talk to you, and um, also just an open invitation, we're trying to work with Santa Rosa and having your whole church up on campus, maybe out for a church or a camp out or something, we want you guys to utilize our campus too, and what we've been blessed with in, in all of our nature that we have, so thank you so much, Brad, Pastor Brad, for letting us be here this morning.
And it was Pastor Craig from Neon Meadows. Brad, we've decided we are extending an invitation for you to come and work for us this summer as a basketball camp counselor. And I was stoked. For good reason. I, I will tell you that besides the memories of my life that are connected to my family, there are there is nothing that has been more impactful and special to me, memories that are close to me, than the, those that I made working at summer camp. I mean, just the, the, the shenanigans, to use a word, and the, the relationships, the experiences, they, they're just so formative and special to me. That, that camp is holy ground for me. In fact, we had a couple of students, let's see, we had a few people who were at the camp this summer. I'm very jealous of them. I love so when we see that, I'm so excited. So excited. Because I knew what summer camp was all about. I learned it from my parents. They both worked at summer camp. Summer camp is all about dating. And I was excited. I was just trying to do it for myself. I'm not ready. I was really excited. I, there was a call. I understood that day. This was a call to meet the woman of my dreams. I was quite, so excited. That was the call for me. You know, sometimes the call is to leave home, sometimes the call is to one place or another, but in some ways, you know, there's always a call, and it re requires movement, it invites movement. Moses was called to go back home. Abram was called to leave home. Today we're looking at someone, Matthew, who is called not so much to leave home, but to leave what he was up to in life in a very profound and significant way. In the book of Matthew, chapter 9, we pick up his story. It begins, and I don't have the clicker here, you have joy and you're amazing, thank you. As Jesus passed from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And it continues. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Where does your teacher eat with tax collectors? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Uh, this story has always fascinated me. It's a fast one. It's a short one. And yet, there's a lot going on. Jesus lays out like three just ringers of statements. And, and in the middle of that... Uh, Matthew seemingly makes an incredibly drastic decision about his life. Jesus approaches Matthew at the tax booth. Matthew is going about his business, collecting taxes, you know, that whole thing. And Jesus simply says in our story, and really any, any gospel you read, the story is the same. Apparently, just says, follow me, and like that. Matthew is just like, yeah, I'm in. What is going on? I mean, can you imagine a scenario where, where someone you potentially have never met before enters your place of work and just says, hey, follow me, and off you would go? Like, not even a two weeks notice, apparently. So what is Matthew up to? And, and part of the way that we understand the story, when Matthew makes this incredibly drastic decision is, is by understanding who Jesus was. And when I talk about Jesus, you, you have some sense of, of who he was. You know, we use language like, well, the Son of God, and he's the Messiah, and he is, you know, he's got some churches dedicated to him and all that. But for those that Jesus is meeting, for Matthew, Jesus is a rabbi. And that meant something really significant in Jewish culture, in Matthew's culture. A rabbi was 
It, it's hard to really give a, a, a one for one comparison, but I, I would think of a rabbi personally. I would think of a rabbi as like a professional athlete. A rabbi in Jewish culture was the, the thing that every young Jewish boy grew up wanting to be. It was like everyone wanted to be it. And they, they, that was their aspiration in life. They were the, the all-stars of the culture. When the rabbi came to town, the, the town would gather together and, and go to the synagogue to hear them teach. People would invite them into their homes to provide their best meals. They would, they would sit in a place of honor at, at feasts. They were invited. I mean, they were just they were the rock stars of the Jewish world. And in the same way, every young boy in, in Jesus' day, they would, they would start their lives preparing to be a rabbi. They would begin to, to learn about the, the Hebrew scriptures. And if they sort of passed a series of tests through childhood and became the best of the best, they could be invited to become a disciple of a rabbi on the track to become one of these Jewish rock stars. It was, it, it, it's very much how children these days, we start playing music, or we start playing sports, and, and eventually as time goes on, sort of, you know, the, the sports go out the window and we, we, we maybe aren't so good at basketball as we thought we were. Or, or maybe we weren't as good at playing guitar as we thought we were. Or, or whatever the case, and eventually we wind up, you know, sort of being a pastor or selling insurance or something like that, rather than playing for the Giants. Well, that's what happened in Jesus' day. I mean, as a child, you began on the path of becoming a rabbi. But eventually... Those that didn't cut it, most of the ones that didn't cut it, they just wound up pursuing the trade of their father. Father was a carpenter, you were a carpenter. Your father was a fisherman, you were a fisherman. In Matthew's case, things are a little bit different. It's hard to really put our finger on precisely what how Matthew wound up becoming a tax collector because tax collectors were, well, they were the worst. They were the worst. And that's, they, they, they're so bad that, in fact, if you open up your Bible app or you get on Google and you, you search for the phrase tax collectors and sinners, you will find in the New Testament that almost every time the Bible mentions tax collectors, it is accompanied by and sinners. Which is to say that for the authors of Scripture, being a tax collector was so abhorrent that it needed its own category. It wasn't enough to just say, oh, look at all the sinners over there. there they, it was so abhorrent, they needed to say, look at the sinners and the tax collectors. <laughs> but then, and that's the way it is. All the Scriptures, always the sinners and the tax collectors. In our story. Jesus, he goes to Matthew's house. The Pharisees have some things to say, and they say, what? Oh, look, and he feasts with the sinners and the tax collectors. It was in it. And it's not surprising. He, the, the Jews are part of a culture that has for centuries been under the thumb of the Roman Empire. Their soldiers are marching the streets. Their puppet governors are controlling the country. Their, the religious leaders are kind of at their beck and call. They aren't able to live life both culturally and religiously and otherwise the way that they want to because of the Romans. And on top of that, they have to pay taxes. The Romans, though, they're, they're smart. You've know, you got to be smart to have an empire that lasts for centuries after century after century. And so they would hire locals to be the tax collectors. Their thinking was, hey, who better is going to know whether or not the Johnsons and the Millers are hiding some grain in the basement than the, than the people that they grew up with? It was a really lucrative job, if you could put up with being as 
absolutely hated by everyone. It, it was the sort of thing that makes parents cringe. Oh, Mrs. Matthew, what is your son up to these days? Did he go to, did he, did he want to, and, and Mrs. Matthew and Mr. Matthew, they would go to their dinner parties and people would ask what Matthew was up to and they, they would, they would, you know, sort of, oh, well, he's still trying to find himself. Uh, <clears throat> it would have been a shame. The, the view of, of the Jewish people was, look, we don't like the Romans, but at least the Romans were born to it. At least they're just following their, their own culture, their own people. But the, the tax collectors, you grew up a Jew. You have experienced what we have experienced, and you've decided that wealth is more important to you than your family and your people and your religion. I hate your tax collectors. So it's hard to know exactly how Matthew wound up being a tax collector. Perhaps it was his, his father's church. And he was born into being hated by everyone around him. Perhaps he was desperate for money for some reason. We don't know. What we do know is that the fact that he is a tax collector is a tragedy. It's not just that he, he is some undesirable. He is the most undesirable. And then the rock star comes to town. Jesus. The guy that, that word has been going around throughout the countryside, he comes to town. You've heard things. He does kinds of miracles. He, he heals the sick. You should hear him speak. It's like nothing I've ever heard. He, he's so good that, that the Pharisees and the re religious leaders are And he comes to town. And as we read, pick up the story, Jesus has been busy in town. But he doesn't find Luke about what he's been doing. He finds Luke at the tax booth. Luke wasn't even brave enough to leave the tax booth, which would have been guarded by soldiers, to go see Jesus. But when Jesus shows up and says those two simple, profound words, follow me. His life is changed. I mean, it, is, it, was, it would literally be like if the, the warriors called me right now and said, hey, would you be willing to be our 15th man? <laughs> what? Sorry to the family. <laughs> but if the, if the giants are like, hey, listen, we, we, need, we need another righty in the bullpen. You know, you're probably not going to pitch, but just come and watch the games in the bullpen fine, we'll pay a couple million dollars. But what? That is his experience. I mean, Matthew has had his dream. He has gone from being the most hated person in town to now he is with the guy the crowds are desperate to see, are clamoring to. They're coming to him and saying, Matthew, hey, do you think we can get Jesus over here? Do you think he has time and his schedule to come to our house? Do you think he can come and visit my son? He's had a sniffle. Hey, this is transformative for Matthew in every way, culturally, vocationally, emotionally. His family, imagine all of a sudden, mom and dad, not only do they have to be coy about what little Matthew does, they say, oh, he's the disciple of the rabbi. Which rabbi? The rabbi. This is everything. And scripture is so simple about it. I mean, he just, he has the invitation, he just goes. You love what Matthew's done. He, he's so excited about it. As we pick up the story here in verse 11, he's so excited about it that he immediately calls together 
his skin, verse 10, excuse me. And, and, and he's at Matthew's house, and tax collectors and sinners come, and they're reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Why did the tax collectors and the sinners come? The Ross says, willing to come to Matthew's house. Misery loves company. That's all the only option that they have. And so he's so excited, he just calls all of the other people who are broken like him, who have been shoved to the outside of culture and family and religion like him, and he, he brings them to his home and he says, look, Jesus wants me. He wants one of us to be with him. It's amazing. It's the best day of his life. The best times of his life. And then in verse 11 we see, well, no good deed goes unpunished. The Pharisees see, what? They're sinners and they're angry. That's not this. They come to the disciples of Jesus and they say, what? Why is the teacher, why is the rabbi, you know, he's like us. Why is he with them? We would never. I would never. Why is he with them? Imagine that moment for Matthew. Here he is celebrating with the only people left in his life who have been willing to stand to be around him at all. Celebrating this unbelievable moment. And the church folks show up and say, How dare! How could he? As a senior in high school, just shortly after I got that call from the other night, I was like, I got another call. It was January 31st. I was home early from, from school as a senior. And senior writers had said, double time, phone rang at home. It was my aunt. She said, hey, Bradley, what, is your mom here? Did you get I said, no, no, it's just me. She's not really upset. What's going on? He said, your, your cousin Brandon is in a car accident. He needs help. Just a couple of years old. Easily the, clo the closest family member in our family. And it was just a, a punch in the gut. He was a task force worker at Georgia Cumberland Academy as a chaplain. So do you pass it? Whoa, whoa. So often the good things in life, they, they come with they come with the bad things, don't they? Calls come in all shapes and sizes. Matthew as 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 the word of the Pharisees sort of Telling Jesus, well, how dare you spend time with tax collectors and sinners? You can almost see the wheels turning in Matthew's head. Is this too good to be true? Is Jesus going to gonna say, hey, you know what? You're right. I'm out of here. Enough with these, these people. But instead, oh, Jesus, instead, Jesus just drops. Three of the most amazing lines you will find in his lexicon. I'm going to pull it up in that second slide, 11 and 13. But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus is, is, is so simple and clear, but it's, it's amazing how he responds to the, the nastiness that has been introduced into this celebration. He's saying, I, I am a physician. Why would I spend time with the well? I, I spend time with the sick. <clears throat> I was thinking about this, that line from, I'm thinking about what it would be like for me to be a doctor. 
shivers. He had to be a doctor. And I realized this is the one specialty I'm qualified for. What do you thought? I'm the doctor for the people who have nothing wrong with them. I'm, just, I'm the physician for the well. Wow, what? Well, what happens if someone, they go to someone else? <laughs> Nothing's wrong? Come on in. Oh, you've got it? And, and, yep, yeah, no, you've got to go see Dr. Uh, this is my medical call. Jesus said, look, 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 there's no physician for the well. There's a physician for the sick. This is, in effect, exactly where I need to be. You love how quickly he undermines the, the challenge of the Pharisees, how quickly he steps into the doubt of Matthew and his associates, the, the sinners and tax collectors. And, and then he drops this line from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For a Jew, your life was so much wrapped up in sacrifice. There were sacrifices for everything. A child was born. You go to the temple and you honor God by offering a sacrifice. You, you do something wrong in your life. You go to the temple and you offer a sacrifice for, for the forgiveness of your sins. You, you become a tax collector and you, 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 you sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. There are sacrifices at specific times of the year. There are sacrifices at specific times of the of the every seven year calendar, the every forty year. What is Jesus talking about? I, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What does that mean? That's what they're that's what they're busy with. Jesus is. Explain to the Pharisees, explain to us that sacrifice, which is to say religious activity is not an end unto itself. It's not the point. The goal of the sacrifices is not the sacrifices, but rather that they result in mercy through Jesus. God is not in need of all these sacrifices. They are simply the means by which before Jesus, he is offering mercy. That's the goal. The faithful activity isn't the end. He said, look, you're, 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 you're so uppity about these, these sinners and these tax collectors because you keep the Sabbath. He said, but that, did you receive the rest? But because you joined the right church, but did you let Jesus into your life? Because you you paid the tithe, but, but you place your trust in, G, in God to provide. It, it is not about activity. That's not the goal. In fact, it is the mercy of God, the reception of His mercy, that is the goal. And so oh, Jesus drops this line I come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Come to call the righteous, not sinners. Probably a better way of reading that is to say, I come to call not the people who think they're righteous, but the people who know they are not. I got some young there at the end of my senior year. Great, like you girls. Friday night rolled around and Pastor Craig did something that really messed me up. Sun went down and he invited us into a communion service. In the middle of the communion service, he, he challenged us. He said, I don't know why you came to camp. He said, I need you to understand that you are here to lead young people to Jesus. And then that shook me. How can I lead anyone to Jesus when I don't even know him? How can I? And I began to think about my cousin. Think about the opportunity I had. Think about all the, the, the call that I was being given. 
And I did the only thing that summer that I knew how to do, which is I just started cracking open my Bible. Started in Genesis. If I were being honest, got a little lost somewhere in the business. I just knew I needed to be with Jesus. Calling as a Christian is not primarily about what you do or accomplish. It's not. It is first and foremost about who you are with. Jesus. You are called to be with Jesus. He is inviting you into his presence. He's giving you the opportunity to follow him wherever he may go. It might be to leave home. It might be to go home. It might be to change careers. It might be to go down your career. It, it, what you do is secondary. First and foremost, he's just calling us to be with him. And, and he's doing so, so intentionally. He said, not because you deserve to be with me. Not because you should be that and clean up. But because you don't deserve it. That's why I'm here. That's why, that's why I want to be with you. That's why I've come. I'm calling you to be with me. Because he understands that, that his presence is a therapy for the sickness of sin. Church, we are each called with that special purpose. And that's really where it begins. To just enter the presence of Jesus. Wherever he calls and invites you to follow. And just go. That's it. Let's pray to the Lord. What a blessing it is to go be called where we are. Not because we are worthy, but rather because we are not. We enter your presence with thanksgiving today. In Jesus' name.
And that involves for us hiring a associate pastor. And uh, I would say I'm extremely grateful for that personally. And we want to continue pursuing that. We believe, I believe, that children are the energy of the church, but that our young adults, our youth, are the heart of the church. And we want to invest in that heart. That means for us, we're taking on the challenge of providing that position financially. And so if God is leading you to give, please do so as much as you are able. Let us pray together. Lord, we pray a blessing over our food. We pray a blessing over our community, both here in Santa Rosa at Rio and Redwood, Healdsburg, Sebastopol, Petaluma, and beyond. Lord, we are with you. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath.